Hello everyone, welcome back to another video where today I just want to talk a little bit about the DWM Doctor Who items. Obviously I won't be going over the whole magazine and I have bought it both physically and digitally. So feel free to obviously buy the magazine yourselves, read through it all. I'm just going to go over and cherry pick some of the bits that I thought were interesting and that I perhaps didn't cover in yesterday's live stream. But before we get into it, if you could do me a teeny tiny little favour and click that subscribe button, that'd be ever so much appreciated. We are now less than 100 subscribers away from 16,000, which is just mental. So uh, if you could help us get there, that would be greatly appreciated. Also, go follow me on Twitter if you want to, although that's not required, the link to which will be in the description below. I'd also like to take this opportunity to say that I do have a P.O. box, so if you'd like to send me anything and have it opened in either a live stream or a video, you can send it to the address in the corner. But with that said, let's get into the video. So yeah, here's my digital copy just to show that I did in fact buy it. I've also got a physical copy coming that hasn't arrived yet, but yeah, just to show that I did in fact buy this issue of Doctor Who magazine. You can also get within the issue a free audiobook, an 8th Doctor audiobook, so feel free to... Uh, Get that if you buy the physical copy. So the first thing I wanted to go over was just some pictures, which have been compiled by uh, Reese Photoshop era. Thank you for that. Uh, this first one depicts 13 with her goggles on from, I guess, Series 12 in Nikola Tesla. She wore those, and I believe we already fell through with that as well. It's hard to really tell what location she's meant to be in here. I would say the TARDIS initially, but looking at it, it looks more like a cyber ship to me, but could be anything, really but my money is on currently a cyber ship of some variety. We also have this shot of 13 and Yaz in the TARDIS looking perplexed by something. Not much to glean from this one. This is kind of just, you know, a standard, pretty standard image for the show. You know, a lot of images like this throughout this era. This is one more of those. Yeah, there's not much to glean from this one, but interesting nonetheless. Here we have the image of Ace, who appears to be in the volcano, which we saw in the trailer, and you can see the silhouettes of some Daleks just there. I did cover this in the last live stream, so I probably won't go into too much depth here, but yeah, very cool nonetheless. We also have this one, which depicts Vinda in some sort of spaceship with a gas mask on. I'm going to assume it's a spaceship on the basis that he has like a joystick by him, so that implies to me that he's piloting something. We did see in the trailer him flying what appears to be a spaceship, so I'm going to assume that's the spaceship that he's flying here. Honestly, I keep forgetting Vinda's in this one, which is kind of mad, but it's just there's so much going on in this story that uh, someone is always kind of going to get forgotten about in that way. But yeah, uh, it's a cool shot nonetheless. We also have a shot of these three in their spacesuits in the TARDIS. Interestingly, and again, I think this is a cool thing to point out, Dan very rarely has appeared outside of this spacesuit in the promotional stuff for Power of the Doctor, which is making me think he's not going to have a major part to play in this story, at least I don't think, anyway. We also have this shot of uh, Jodie walking towards the TARDIS. If I had to guess, I would assume this is um, towards the end of the episode. I would say this is her walk towards maybe, you know, her final moments. It's giving very much Caves of Androzani with uh, the, the quarry and the sort of TARDIS in the backdrop there. Also sort of end of time with Tennant walking towards his TARDIS in his final moments. Yeah, to me, this is very much evoking final moments for sure. Here we have the Doctor and Yaz first seeing Ace and Tegan for the first time. You can tell the Doctor's shocked. Yaz is looking confused as if to say, who are these guys? And obviously it's it's the Doctor's past friends. So yeah, that's a cool image. And then we have Yaz in the spacesuit herself. And then to wrap up, we have a better quality image of the picture that I showed yesterday of what appears to be 13 and Yaz in the volcanic caves. Yaz in the TARDIS up close, it, which seems like a similar shot to... The earlier shot, but obviously a close-up on Yaz this time, rather than both the Doctor and Yaz. We have Dan in the spacesuit with the caption, No Laughing Matter, which has been uh, cleared out just to show Dan in the spacesuit. Again, apparently as well, obviously I haven't read the full John Bishop segment, but apparently Power of the Doctor is barely mentioned in it. So that kind of lends credence to the idea that he's not a major entity in this episode. And then finally, we have this scene of what appears to be Dan getting dropped off, what it looks to be anyway, because this looks to be where his house initially was in Flux, which is interesting because his house is no longer there. So is he just going to be dropped off without a house? Like, that would be terrible. But yeah, this is the first time outside of unofficial uh, filming images that we've seen Dan outside the spacesuit for Power of the Doctor, I believe. So my assumption is perhaps 
there is a close call on the bullet train or something, and that leads to him going, right, that was way too close, I'm going to head back home. Although, how he's going to head home without a house, I'm not sure. If Dan does indeed leave the story this early on, and isn't really a major entity in the rest of the story, I'm going to wonder somewhat what the point of bringing Dan into the series at all was, because whilst I think John Bishop was great fun in the stories, I feel like you could remove Dan from Flux, and especially if in Power of the Doctor he doesn't contribute much, and you wouldn't really lose a lot, so um, that's certainly interesting. Yaz is also stood outside there, but I don't think this is where she gets dropped off, because this looks a lot more like Dan's sort of home to me. There have also been several interesting nuggets from showrunner Chris Chibnall. This one particularly caught my eye, Bad Wolf Archives, thank you for putting this up on Twitter, saying, Chris Chibnall has described the power of the Doctor as the perfect lead-up to the events in the 60th anniversary, saying it worked out very nicely. Very interested to see how these stories intertwine. Yeah, so, and then someone asks in the replies there, does he know about the 60th plot, or is he just meaning because it's a big special with callbacks? And then in response, Bad Wolf Archive said, he said he didn't know RTD's ideas before he completed the script, but that the stories themselves ended up working together very well. So there we are. So we can at least infer that like there's going to be some crossover between Power of the Doctor and the 60th. Whether fully intentional or not, there is going to be some level of interconnectivity between the two stories, which I find particularly interesting. We also have had Jodie Whittaker discussing Thasmin, saying how the idea was brought to her via the hashtag and stuff, and how it went over her head, but how she's happy that it, it meant so much to many people, and how the Doctor is always destined to be alone and stuff. That implies to me, actually, that I don't think Thasmin is going to be evolved much beyond where we see it in Legend of the Sea Devils, where the Doctor says, I can't fix myself to anyone, or anything, and even if it was, to be fair, even if that has been was continued beyond that point uh, in terms of the characters, it wouldn't be able to be for too long because of basically, well, 13's going to die in this episode. So, yeah, my assumption is that we're not going to get any major, like, Thasmin continuations in this episode beyond Legend of the Sea Devils. From what they're saying here about how the Doctor's always destined to sort of be alone, that seems like the bookend to that storyline rather than a continuation, at least to me. And then we also have this great tease at the end of Doctor Magazine, saying the next DWM will help usher in a new era. The moment has been prepared for with something special that is unprecedented in the magazine's history. We're on sale 10th of November, and you won't want to miss it. So yeah, that's very exciting. Next month we'll have a next era issue, a David Tennant era issue. I am assuming that what they're referring to is we're going to get a cover with David Tennant as the Doctor for November 10th. If that is the case, and they're covering that in the next issue, that kind of does lead credence to my theory of a Christmas special, because, you know, if they're ramping up coverage on the new era in the next issue, and that's November, you know, given that DWM is a monthly release, kind of makes sense. Obviously, I'm not holding my breath, but it would kind of check out. And then the final little thing that I want to talk about is that after the Power of the Doctor is broadcast, Russell C. Davis will formally take over as chairman and head writer, overseeing the adventures of the 14th Doctor, which begin in 2023. The interesting thing here is, this is the one of the first times in Doctor Who publications that we've heard, we've heard to the 14th Doctor referred to specifically. The interesting thing here, the interesting thing here though, is that the magazine is very careful to not specify an actor attached to the 14th Doctor, Shuti Gatwa or David Tennant. So my theory is Tennant will technically be the 14th Doctor in terms of incarnation. He'll sort of be an in-between weird incarnation in the same vein as the War Doctor, and then Shuti will be the official 14th Doctor. There's also some interesting stuff about the cancer scene with Graham in Can You Hear Me and how that was based on Chris Chibnall's own personal experience, but I already covered that in yesterday's live stream. so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a clip for you where I discuss that very topic. Apparently a lovely moment in Doctor Magazine, uh, in the Chris Chibnall interview, because obviously he gets interviewed as well, saying where he talks about his own cancer diagnosis and why he put Graham and the Doctor's conversation in Can You Hear Me? I'm so thankful for his writing. So yeah, I didn't know that, um, that uh, Chris Chibnall had a cancer diagnosis. This does kind of fall in line with uh, what we know of Chris Chibnall to put his own personal experience into his stories. You know, a good example being the Timeless Child, and he's basically, he said, funnily enough, in another edition of Doctor Magazine, that that was based on his like personal experience with adoption and stuff. My one thing with this, and obviously it's not a slight on Chris Chibnall, but I've seen the response 
from some people. I've seen some people saying that, like, the fact that it's based on his own personal experience kind of makes the criticism and people saying, you know, it perhaps wasn't quite, perhaps wasn't quite sensitive to their own issues. It kind of makes that irrelevant. And I completely disagree with that. As much as I respect, you know, Chris Chibnall's own dealings with uh, the likes of cancer or his adoption story, everyone's experiences with those things are different and none of them are invalid. And to say that, obviously, I don't think Chris Chibnall's are invalid in the same way that I think, I think a good example where I can come at this from is that I, you know, I'm a disabled guy myself and I know many people with uh, dyspraxia and stuff. And I've had that conversation with people who have really struggled with the representation of Toes and Coles, um, or uh, Brian Sinclair's dyspraxia, I should say. And I know that I believe one of, I'm not 100% on this, but I think one of Chris Jewell's kids has dyspraxia, and he worked with the Dyspraxia Foundation to incorporate it into the show, which is a great, great thing, and I'm not going to try and diminish that in any way. But what I will say is, just because the right steps are taken, or because someone has experience, it doesn't necessarily mean that the depictions are above criticism, because at the end of the day, it's one person's experience, you know. Minorities and their experiences, they're not a monolith. Like, everyone has different experiences with that. So yeah, I just kind of wanted to get that out of the way because I saw a bit of discourse surrounding that. Basically, respect everyone's um, experiences with that stuff. Everyone's experiences are, you know, valid. Just because one's in a TV show, it doesn't make it, you know, more valid than anyone else who perhaps, you know, feels that that experience doesn't represent what they went through. You know, it just means that this is the one that made it to screen. I hope that makes sense. But yeah, I want to get that off my chest because I've seen some discourse surrounding that. But yeah, let me know in the comments below what you think about anything we discussed. Do you think Dan is going to be dropped off relatively early? Do you think Thasmin's going to be continued? How much do you think the centenary is going to tie into the 60th? What do you think this next issue of DWM entails? Whatever your thoughts are, drop them down in the comments below. Let's talk about it. Like this video if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new. And I'll see you later.